Hey YouTube, I'm Jimmy. In this video, I'm going to walk through my analysis of the Intel Corporation, ticker symbol INTC. This continues our series where we're analyzing all 30 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. This is the 15th video in the series. We're halfway through. And you can see a link to all the videos in the description below. Then, after we're done with all 30 companies, we're going to go out and try to build three different portfolios, a value, a growth, and a dividend portfolio. Intel's business is broken into five main segments. Their largest segment is the client computing group. This segment targets notebook and desktop markets. They recently launched their eighth generation of Intel's core processors and the Intel Core X series. Then we have the data center segment. That segment focuses on products for the cloud and for communica communication infrastructure. This segment has the potential to keep growing from both artificial intelligence and the cloud. Then we have the Internet of Things segment. This segment over the past five years has grown at an average rate of 15% a year, which is fantastic. This segment makes up high performance products for the retail, automotive, industrial, and other embedded applications. This is a rapidly evolving segment, so Intel needs to do what it can to stay ahead of the curve when it comes to innovation. Then we have the non-volatile memory solutions group and the programmable solutions group. The memory segment, they focus on making 3D NAND flash memory, and that's used in solid state memory devices. Then they have the programmable solutions group. They focus on making programmable semiconductors, and that's used in cars, military, data centers, communications, industrials, and so on. Now, Intel has claim, claims that over the past year, this segment, both of these segments look to really be picking up speed. So that's a good thing. So I've done research on a bunch of different industries, and I was curious to see how Intel was going to stack up from a performance perspective relative to some of the other companies we've done. And I'm not sure if you saw our recent IBM video, we just published it a few days ago, but I was, I was surprised to see the slide in revenue that IBM has had over the past few years. So when I got to Intel, I was pleasantly surprised that this chart, this is the revenue chart, goes back to 2011. And as you can see, after being flat for a few years, it looks like revenue is starting to jump up. Now these green bars, they're estimates, but the first three quarters of 2018 are already closed. So this 2018 estimate is really just how will the fourth quarter add to the first three quarters. But now let's look at margins. And as we can see, gross profit margins have been a bit all over the place. And although 2018 looks to be better, it seems that analyst expectations are that 2019 gross margins will pull back a bit. Now, when we switch over to net income margins, we can see that what really stands out is the expected jump in 2018 and 2019. So if things really play out that way, well, that would really be nice for earnings per share and perhaps the stock price. Now, when I'm analyzing a stock, I like to look at a few different ratios to see what we can uncover about the company, any information we can see to try to understand what they do or how they're doing it. Since we're planning to put together a dividend portfolio, I think it's good that we could start there to see how that looks. So this chart illustrates the trailing 12-month dividends going all the way back to 2008 and the dividend yield at that time. The current dividend yield is about 2.5%. That's the red line, and that's tied to the right axis. And we also have the blue bars, which tell you how much the dividend actually was. We can see that it's about $1.20 over the past four quarters. And we can see that Intel has done a great job of consistently paying their dividend. Generally, they raise their dividend every year and then keep it that way for the full year. The only real exception was right here where they kept it about flat for about two years. So from a dividend perspective, they seem quite reliable. Now the question is, can they keep it up? Well, one good way to tell is by looking at their dividend payout ratio. Ideally, we want this ratio to be as low as possible. What this ratio looks at is how much net income, how much of net income did Intel pay out in the form of dividends? Now, you may notice that in Q4 2017, there's no bar at all. And this is because Intel had a one-time loss according to US GAAP. They lost money in that quarter. Therefore, the dividend they did pay out, it was against a negative number, so they put zero here. Now, as an analyst, one of the first things I do when I see a one-time loss or a gain is to look to see if it's really a one-time thing and what's the story behind it. In Intel's case, that was related to taxes, and it did in fact look like it was going to be only a one-time hit. 
So, as an analyst, I would typically add this number back. And had it been a one-time gain, well, I, was, I would have subtracted that number from earnings. Now, that's how you end up with a chart that looks like this. The blue lines are US GAAP, and the orange lines are analyst adjustments. And sometimes you can see that analysts adjust things higher, sometimes they adjust things lower. Now, this brings me to a quick side note. When we switch this chart from net income to revenue, we can see that both analyst adjusted revenue and gap revenue are the same. And this is true almost all the time. And that's because revenue is very hard to mess with. You either sold something or you didn't. And you may hear it called net revenue, and that they call it net because that's after products are returned. So net revenue accounts for products that are sold to the customer and the customer keeps them. Once they're returned, they get deducted from revenue. And I think that this is important because when we switch back to net income, we can see how much net income can be adjusted, how much, how much it can be messed around with. Now, I think there's lots of ways for management to move numbers around, and I, each time that can have a big impact on things. But our job as analysts is to try to move them back to both make them more comparable to other companies and to get a truer sense of what profits really look like. That's why generally you'll see me use adjusted earnings. Now, another ratio you can use to check the efficiency of the business is something called inventory turnover. Basically, inventory turnover looks at how many times inventory is sold and replaced over whatever the period, whatever the time period is. In this case, it's a year. So as we can see, the most recent point is about 3.8 times. And the higher, the better for this ratio. So the fact that this ratio is declining for Intel tells us that Intel is selling their products less quickly. Now, another ratio that tells a similar story is something called the cash conversion cycle. This ratio tells us how many days it takes for the company to convert inventory into cash. Now, technically, this ratio includes inventory, receivables, and payables. So the cash conversion cycle is basically, it says, okay, Intel sold the product, Intel collected the receivables, and then they paid their payables. How long does it take to convert cash around the loop again back to cash? Now, I don't want to necessarily hold this rise in cash conversion cycle, which is a bad thing, by the way, and I don't want to necessarily hold it against them, and here's why. This chart here shows the breakdown of how cash conversion cycle is calculated. The orange bars represent 2017, where the cash conversion cycle was 87 days, and the blue bars represent 2014, where the cash conversion cycle was about 51 days. So inventory days are up, which tells us that the average days at inventory is being held. Often this can tell us that management is doing a good or a bad job of predicting whether or not they're going to be able to sell their inventory. So this being up is a bad thing. We want to see, does this keep getting worse going forward? And how much worse? We don't want management to be too bad at that because we don't want them to have to carry inventory for a long period of time. Then we have DSO, which is days of sales outstanding. This measures how many days it takes the company to collect the cash from their customers. So if this number spikes, it could imply that management is loosening their payment policy. Maybe they made them pay in 30 days before, now they gave them 60 days. Well, depending on the reason that this is increasing, that could mean something, it could tell us something about the business. In Intel's case, it's only up slightly, so I'm not too concerned with it. Then for accounts payable turnover, it looks like Intel is paying their payables a bit faster. Now, if you think about it from a business perspective, that's not too bad of a thing, but from a cash conversion cycle, it's a negative thing. For the cash conversion cycle, ideally what you want is you're barely holding any inventory, you can turn it over super fast, you take a long, long time to pay your vendors, and they pay you right away, all your customers pay you right away. That being said, what do we think that Intel's worth? And given the business and the, the reliability of their discounted cash flow, I think, uh, the reliability of their free cash flow, I think that using a discounted cash flow valuation is a good method to use. So, for free cash flow, we're using analyst estimates, and we have a whack of 9%, a perpetual growth rate of 2.5%, which I think is a reasonable perpetual growth rate to use, and we get a fair value of about $60 per share. Now, if you're not sure how we came up with these numbers, I have links in the description below to different videos that we made for this entire process. So, going back to Intel, when we consider that Intel's current price is about $49 per share, our $60 fair value estimate looks pretty good since that $60 is more than 20% away from the current price. I think that when 
we go to put together our portfolios, it's likely that Intel appears like it should end up in the dividend portfolio, the value portfolio based on the current price, and maybe the growth portfolio, depending on how their efficiency ratios look at that time. I think it's something that we want to we want to monitor because I don't want it to go too crazy for any extended period of time. But what do you think? Let me know what you think of Intel. And if you own Intel already, or if you consider buying it, uh, what has your research shown you that's perhaps different from what our research has shown you? Do you think it belongs in our portfolio? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And thanks for sticking with us all the way to the end of the video. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.